Well, I am excited this morning, and uh, there's just a, I'm not used to this. Usually, Marcy gets the stand for me, and now I've got to get the, the stand for Marcy, but I'm excited to have Marcy preach for us this morning. A uh, little background on uh, Marcy. Uh, she is studying to, be, to get her district license from the Iowa District Church of the Nazarene, so that's a big deal. She's received her local license from our church and from our church board, and so over the course of this next uh, year, uh, next April will be when she goes before a bunch of other pastors, and they will just grill her incessantly about her life and every decision she's ever made uh, before, and they'll deem her worthy or unworthy, uh, and it's not really that bad, so she'll do a great job. Uh, but she's in school now. She's actually taking classes um, to become a, a minister, and uh, from what she's shared with me so far, she feels called to be a worship pastor, um, and I said that doesn't get you out of having to preach every once in a while, so... Uh, she's going to share with us this morning. I'm excited uh, for what God has laid on her hearts. And uh, would you just kind of be in prayer for her as she shares with us this morning? And I'll get that stand for you now. Yelling at me. Oh, there we go. That I need to turn that on. Um, I'm going to grab my block here, the Holy Spirit, but I forgot my Bible up here, so. I think it's my earrings. Sorry, hold on just a second. Technical difficulty. together. I'm so sorry. Now my head's going to be lopsided. Okay, there we go. I got my Bible, I got my block, and my earrings are out. I think we're good. (laughs) Sorry, I knew stepping into this that it was going to be some funny things happen. (laughs) Okay, so, as RJ said before I place this block, my name is Mercy Prose, and I know a lot of you here in Bloomfield know me, but maybe not a whole lot in Sheraton. So, um, just the kind of backstory: I've been worship leader here since January of 2018 was when I took that position, and about a year ago, I stepped up to RJ and said, "I really have this call on my heart that I need to do more and." go through the teachings and the school and all that. Um, And also, I'm married to Adam, so pray for him or pray for me. I mean, wherever you land on that one. But (laughs) (laughs) And we have four beautiful children together. So just for those of you guys joining us in Sheraton now, you know just a little bit about me. As RJ said, we're going to discuss the Holy Spirit today, so I'm going to place this block on our, what we are building here of all the articles of faith we have in the Church of the Nazarene. Sorry, I need to step back. Guys, warn me if I'm going to run into something, please. (laughs) Sorry. I'm all kinds of mess today, huh? Okay. Okay, Um, so as I was dropping David off at school one day, um, I heard this song on the radio, and we don't normally listen to radio, but Adam had a Cubs game on the night before, so the radio was just on in the car, and the words of this song totally caught me differently. Like, I've listened to this song a lot. I used to work at a dentist office, and I've probably listened to it more than those of you that have an occupation that's outside of some place, they play elevator music all day. Um, But anyway, I heard the lyrics of this song, and it just hit me so differently. So I'm going to have Adam play just a little snippet. It's um, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now by Starship. I can tell exactly who lived through the 80s in this room. (laughs) 
guys are all going, yeah, I remember this song. Okay, so the word, like I said, the words of that song just kind of hit me a little differently. I was already starting on this sermon, and I thought through some of those words, you know, nothing's going to stop us now if we're standing heart to heart. And I thought, oh, my goodness, we've got to use that. Um, so... <laughs> I love how God does that. They, like sometimes you're going through something or you're thinking about something and you're reading in your Bible and then all of a sudden this verse finally makes sense. It's such a beautiful thing that God does, right? Well, that the Holy Spirit does for us. Um, today we're going to touch on what we believe here in the Nazarene Church about the Holy Spirit and some gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us and how we can use those gifts to, as the song says, build this dream together and stand heart to heart with God. So first we're going to start out, what do we believe here in the Nazarene Church about the Holy Spirit? We're going to read through the third article of faith. Adam, can you put that up there? There you go. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead, that he is ever-present and efficiently active in and with the Church of Christ, convincing the world of sin, regenerating those who repent and believe, sanctifying believers, and guiding into all truth as it is in Jesus. And so that's what the Church of the Nazarene believes, and we're going to go through that a little bit today. We're going to answer this question. What gifts does the Holy Spirit give? So there's quite a few gifts that are talked about just in our article of faith. And the first one that's talked about is being ever-present and efficiently active. As we read through the scripture, the Holy Spirit is very apparent in the New Testament. We can pick out many verses about the Holy Spirit. As our article of faith said, though, the Holy Spirit's been ever-present. The Holy Spirit's actually mentioned 86 times in the Old Testament. In fact, the Holy Spirit is one of the first things that ever gets mentioned. If we break down Genesis 1-2, we read that the... That the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters in this vast, formless, empty darkness. The Spirit of God was there. In several, several modern versions, translate this word, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get enough limb to actually pronounce this, Ra, Ra, in the sentence, to wind which makes so much sense to me because we know that when we read in Acts 2, the Spirit came upon them like the blowing of a violent wind. And I love that. I love that illustration that the Holy Spirit's like the wind because if you think about it, we can feel the wind and we can see the effects, but we can't see the wind. The Holy Spirit was present at the conception of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove during his baptism. Now, before Jesus' baptism, those around him didn't see him as anyone acting of any authority of the Spirit through the power of the Spirit, even knowing that the angel came to Mary and Joseph. They didn't see him as exceptional. It was when the Spirit came upon him during his baptism that the Holy Spirit consecrated and empowered Jesus for his ministry. This was a prophetic anointing for his mission. And in this beautiful baptism, Jesus accepts his role into servanthood. And the Holy Spirit is ever-present in our lives as well. From the moment of conception, because of Jesus accepting his role into servanthood that led him to the cross where he bled and died and on the third day rose again. Because of what he did, the Holy Spirit came to reside with us. The Church of the Nazarene has an article of faith dealing with prevenient grace, which we'll hear here in a few weeks. So I'm not going to go into it much. But prevenient grace, by definition, is basically grace that comes before we believe that the Holy Spirit is wooing us to come to God. 
And in this wooing, we still have a choice. The Holy Spirit is not irresistibly wooing us. The second gift that the Holy Spirit gives us, it's here in our article of faith, is he gives us wholeness of life through the conviction of sin. It takes our first step of realizing that we're sinners and are repenting for us to get the wholeness of life. We come to that because the Holy Spirit convinces us of our sin and that we need a wholeness of life. And I think it's imperative to point out that the Holy Spirit convinces those who need to repent. Olivia Metcalf, a chaplain at Northwest Nazarene University, has this to say on the matter. We would do well to remember that the Holy Spirit is the one who does the convincing. Christians too often take this work onto their own hands, and much damage is done. We are called to be light and salt, not judge and jury. When we live in Christ by the Spirit, we are salt and light. We season and bring light to the world in such a way that the convicting work of the Spirit can be experienced because of the contrast we provide. The Spirit convicts. We are called to live faithfully. Now, I'm talking right here specifically about people who have not yet repented of their sins, specifically those who have not yet accepted Christ. We are to be an example to them, to help through our actions, through our words, teach them what Christianity looks like. We are called to be, as Olivia said, light and salt, not judge and jury. I find it funny that God had brought me to this part in this path um, because for a long time, I turned away from God because I was surrounded by a lot of Christians. I'll put air quotes around that. <laughs> a lot of Christians that felt like they needed to do my convicting, and they weren't leaving that room for the Holy Spirit to speak to me. As Christians, we need to remember to leave room for the Holy Spirit to work. And my thought this morning that I jotted down in my notes is, as Christians, we would do better serving from love than conviction. So our third gift that we're given by the Holy Spirit in our article of faith, is regenerating those who repent and believe. Now, once again, much like Provenient Grace, we're going to hear another sermon on regeneration <laughs> here in the next coming weeks. But regeneration means we are born again. We are new creations in Christ. We have a new mindset. We leave the old self-centered us behind and embrace the new creation we've become. At salvation, when we repent and believe, we receive the Holy Spirit. Through regeneration, we are given new sensitivity to God's Holy Spirit, and we have better moral discernment. Regeneration is given as a gift. It's a gift that we can be a new creation, that we can strive towards Christ's likeness in our new life. Our fourth gift that we're, that's talked about in our article of faith is sanctifying believers. And much like provenient grace and regeneration, we're going to hear a message on it. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. But I did want to share this quote because it helped me understand a few things about sanctification. Um... William Greathouse used this quote in his book, Wholeness of Christ. Now, William Greathouse is an Ametrius general superintendent of the Church of the Nazarene. He was also president at Trevecca Nazarene College and Nazarene Theological Seminary. He shared this quote by Myron Osberger. The spirit-filled life, or spirit-possessed life, is not one in which we have a certain amount of the spirit, but rather one in which he possesses all of us. 
The spirit-filled life is one in which the spirit expresses himself within an individual as controlling and overflowing force. The conditions of one you, of, is one of yieldedness on our part. We are filled with the spirit as we are emptied of self. Now, Great House had this to say about the quote in his book. It's one thing, therefore, to have the Spirit. It's quite another thing for the Spirit to have us. In the Spirit-filled life, the Holy Spirit is the exact counterpart of the sin that dwells in me as a person of the flesh. I love how Great House puts that. It's one thing to have the Spirit, but it's another to let the Spirit have us. Now, the fifth gift that the Holy Spirit gives us in our article of faith is guides us into all truth. Now, the gifts from the Spirit do not just stop in sanctification, neither in our article nor in real life. There's way more to learn Beyond our sanctification moment, there is more growth to be done in us, and the Holy Spirit will guide us. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, but we have to be willing to grow, to be taught, and we need to make sure that, what we're, that we are doing our part to learn. I think about the, the graduates today and... Um, when I graduated, just because I graduated didn't mean that I stopped learning. I stopped participating in that learning culture. When we go into a classroom, we listen to the lectures, we read the texts, we take the tests. This type of learning isn't just in a classroom. As I said, as we grow older, we need to listen to directions from our boss, maybe read directions, and we have to make sure that what we are doing is done correctly. We can't ignore all the teachings and be successful. And we have to constantly be open to that teaching. We have to constantly be learning. We have to constantly be in the Word, and we have to constantly be in communication We can't go into a class or a job and not participate and yet say, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Likewise, we can't come sit at a church and listen to a message and not really listen to it, actually be thinking about all the other things we need to do today. We need to be praying, and we need to be learning. We need to be reading our Bibles. We need to have community with other believers. I believe that's very important. Those, or through those things, we will learn so much, and the Holy Spirit will be able to guide us because we will be a willing participant. Because if we are learning what we need to be learning or doing in our job, what we need to be, the fruits of that will be self-evident, right? And you learn in John, we hear Jesus say, thus by their fruits you will recognize them. Sorry, in Matthew. In Galatians we hear, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But in John, we hear, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so it'll even be even more fruitful. This week, I carried around the Holy Spirit block, and some of you guys have seen it several times this week. <laughs> and um, I wanted to carry it around with me to prove a point to myself that 
I don't have to carry around a foam block for people to know that I'm bringing the Holy Spirit with me. And we shouldn't either. We shouldn't have to carry around a foam block for people to know with, with a cute little symbol of the Holy Spirit, for people to know that we have the Holy Spirit within us. Another verse I wanted to talk about in John is, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. That's John 14, 26. I love how the Holy Spirit's called an advocate in this verse. The word in this verse for advocate is parkaletos. You can fi- find me later if you want to know how to, fi- how to spell that. Um, but the meaning of this word is to be called to one's aid. This is from two words, from para, from close behind, and kaleto means to make a call. We need to be so close to the Holy Spirit that like a good friend... When we come into trouble, we can talk to the Holy Spirit, and we're going to know exactly what he's saying, that he will guide us in the truth, that he will be our advocate, and the fruits of the Spirit will be evident. He will be so close to us that we will know what call he is making because we're so open to the teaching. So, our next thing we're going to talk about is what do we do with these gifts? To find that out, we're going to go to Romans 8. This is personally one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. (coughs) And I know that Pastor Walt just spoke on this uh, last week, but we're going to go through verses 5 through 13 and just kind of focus on these verses Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But in, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. I can just imagine Paul saying this. I don't know if you guys read it and try to read it in Paul's voice, but I almost feel like he's saying, we have an obligation. (laughs) But it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body, you will live. In this passage, we have two things. We have the flesh and the Spirit. We tend to think of the flesh as our body or of our fleshly desires, and that's not really what this passage is all about. Some may tend to think that the flesh is opposite of the spirit, which it is, but really there's more to that. When it says flesh, it means self-serving or self-centeredness. This is what we as Nazarenes believe is the original sin, that Adam was guilty of self-sovereignty, of self-centeredness. And when we say spirit... We mean God-serving and God-centered. Now, I want us to go back through a few of those verses and put 
in self for the flesh and God in for when we say spirit. And I'm just going to read those. Those who live according to self have their mind set on what self desires. Makes sense, right? But those who live in accordance with God have their mind set on what God desires. The mind governed by self is death. But the mind governed by God is life and peace. The mind governed by self is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of self cannot please God. It makes a little more sense now, doesn't it? But then you could say, how do we know what God desires? Through living in the Spirit. By following the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We just learned that one of the gifts that he gives us is to show us the truth. If we're setting our minds on our desires, how can we be setting our minds on what God desires? We can only walk down one path. We can't be partially on God's path for us and partially on our own. I'm going to use another quote from William Greathouse. He says this about Romans 8. By dethroning sin and establishing the reign of grace in us, the spirit deposes the flesh. And some of you may not, you, some of you may know what that word means, but I had to look it up. Deposes means to remove forcefully. By dethroning sin and establishing the reign of grace in us, the spirit removes forcefully our selfishness. In this verse, Paul calls out Christians and realizes that not all among the Christians will be followers or have the Spirit. He says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. That's what it said in Romans 8, 9. And I think back to that verse in Matthew where Jesus says, they will be recognized by their fruits. We are not called to be in the realm of self-centeredness, but in the realm of God-centeredness. If indeed... We let, as Great House said, the Spirit have us. Remember, he said there are two different things. It's different to have the Spirit than to let the Spirit have us. Paul makes it very clear in this passage that if we are self-serving, self-centered, we will die. But one of the wonderful gifts that the Spirit gives us is wholeness of life. Through God's plan, Jesus' servanthood, through the gifts given by the Holy Spirit of wholeness in life for us, regeneration for us, sanctification for us, guiding to truth for us, we don't have to live a life of death. We are able to have life everlasting, but not just that, a wholeness of life. As Paul said, we have an obligation. If we've accepted the gifts of the Spirit, the wholeness of life, regeneration through salvation and sanctification, our obligation is to the Spirit. We need to be obedient to the promptings, and we need to be obedient to doing what we can to learn. We can't just sit and pretend to participate and achieve what we are called to achieve. We need to strive towards Christ's likeness. We need to show the fruits of letting the Spirit have us. 
Later in this verse in Romans, we find that the Spirit brings us into adoption. And some of the other gifts that the Spirit gives us is when we don't know what to say, he intercedes for us through wordless groans. The Spirit also gives us power. Are we just taking these gifts and running off with them? Or are we wrapping them back up and using them for God's glory? As the song said, I love that, that the first voice says, take it to the good times, see it through the bad times. Whatever it takes is what I'm going to do. And then the second voice comes in, let the world around us just fall apart. We can make it if we're heart to heart, heart to heart. And then together they say, we can build this dream together, standing strong forever. Nothing's going to stop us now. We sang this morning, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. And I've always sung that song thinking about it in the church. You are welcome here in our church. Come flood this atmosphere in our church. But this morning I thought of it in a whole new way, a beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit does. You are welcome here. Flood this. Fill this atmosphere. Empty me of me so that all of you is there. Are we letting the Holy Spirit see us through the bad times and take us to the good times? Are we letting him be our advocate and make calls for us as a good friend would? Are we heart to heart with the Spirit? Or are we heart to heart with ourselves? Are we following the promptings of the Holy Spirit in building this dream that will stand forever, the wholeness of life? Are we just playing Christians and being consumers and sitting comfortably in a life pretending we are doing the work, paying attention to the lectures, reading the books, and taking the test? Or have we allowed the Holy Spirit to have us? Remember, the Bible says that the fruits are going to be evident. We are given these gifts from a loving God who desires a deep relationship with us. And through these gifts, we can have a deeper relationship with him. He doesn't want us to just talk to him on holidays. He doesn't want us to just come to him when we have a problem. He wants to speak to us and to guide us in this beautiful life. He wants to use the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But as I said, we have to be open to learn, to listen. We have to have ears that hear, eyes to see, and a heart turned towards God. I was thinking about this this morning. And I like to compare it to this dance. That when you step into a calling, you don't know the steps. But God is placing that in your heart. He's guiding you in the truth of all of this. I thought, how beautiful this life is when we stop trying to make up our own dance, try and stop trying to do our own steps, and when we just let him guide our heart in this dance, it's going to be so beautiful. 
And while we, we may not understand the steps that we're taking, he sees it all. And he's there with us. And he'll guide our heart. But we need to do our part. And we need to be open to that learning. At this time, I'd like to invite the band back up. As we sing this last song, the spirit of the living God, please feel free to come up and speak to God at the altars. You can speak to God there in your seat, too, if you need to. If you have any questions that you want answered or anything stirring in your heart that you need to take care of, I'd pray that you speak to Pastor Walt or Pastor RJ and just be open to that. Let's not leave here today until we have this all taken care of. Let's stand together. There's just even just a little bit of a stirring inside of you this morning. I would encourage you to come. To experience regeneration, if you are, if you are, a, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and you know that there are things that you are doing that that are outside of the will of God or outside of what the spoken uh, or written word of the Bible says, you need to come and be regenerated. If 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 you are not a follower of Christ, and you 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 are experiencing that wooing of the Holy Spirit to call you unto repentance, now is the time to do that. And if you know that you're living right, you're following after Jesus Christ, and you want to take that next step, God is calling you to become a sanctified believer of Christ, which as Marcy explained so well, is just God through the power of the Holy Spirit having all of you. There's not a single thing in your life that is not turned over and given to God. You see, there, there are things that just the devil uses to trip us up, to keep us from being fully surrendered to him. And if that's you this morning and any of those things, I would encourage you to come. Kneel at an altar of prayer and surrender completely to God. And the power of the Holy Spirit will take you where you need to go. I promise you that. He is here and he wants to take you deeper with Jesus Christ and to have you know God more and more and more. We're going to sing the Spirit of the living God fall fresh on me. Spirit of the me mold me
Thank you so much for your presence to the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. Thank you for what we've learned today, that the Holy Spirit, as that third member of the triune God, does so much for us, does so much in us, and then so much through us when we allow Him to work. Holy Spirit, would you work in and through each one of us? that we would allow the power of God to be seen in the fruit of our lives and that we would not give ourselves over to ourselves but that we would fully and completely give ourselves over to God. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful day.